Welcome to Sputnik, orbiting the world with me, George Galloway. And me, Gayatri. There's an awful lot of coffee in Brazil, as the jingle famously said. An awful lot of corruption in the political class, too. Almost every party has its leader either on trial, awaiting trial, or with charges looming. The one person not accused of any personal dishonesty is the president, Dilma Rousseff. So, of course, she's the one that's being thrown out of the office. In a fairly impressively executed maneuver, the Workers' Party presidency is no more. After 12 years, there are 54 million votes swept aside. With the death of Chavez, the travails of Maduro, the defeat and now trial of Kirchner, are we beginning to see the end of the process in Latin America? Joining us to discuss this is Dr. Carolina Matos of City University in London. Dr. Matos, thanks for joining us. Let's establish this first. Is the Workers' Party presidency over, or is there any possibility of her coming back from the dead, as it were? That is a very good question, and that is the key of what the country is currently facing. Um, the fact of the matter is that in the last two months, that's, there's been a growing dissatisfaction with the whole impeachment process. And this has resulted in the last days with also an anger towards the new current government and the ways in which it is, has in only three or four days in office reversed many rights, including extincting the Ministry of Culture, um, Human Rights, uh, Equality, Race, the Secretary of Women, um, also talking about uh, revisiting many of the social programs and benefits. So there's a lot of anger now and also a few people who had voted for the impeachment because they were upset because of after 13 years of government, um, there were many mistakes that the left did, including um, uh, not just in the economy, but also regarding some members of its parties who had been involved in corruption. So these people were disillusioned, but now they are also seeing that perhaps the impeachment thing was not a good idea after all. So the future is still uncertain. Um, there has been a serious defeat, yes, but there's also a perspective that this either could lead to new elections or to a possibility of her returning or to the continuity of Temer. What is certain is that Temer himself, the person who is now acting president of Lebanese extraction, like so many That's right. uh, politicians in Latin America in recent times, is himself facing exactly the same kind of corruption allegations, and there's a process underway that might well put him in the dock. And so that doesn't sound like a very stable uh, situation to me. That's true, but it also looks like the High Supreme Court is not going to take that forward from what I've seen in the last um, a few days. The fact of the matter is that um, the justice system has shown itself to be very biased and against the Workers' Party. Um, despite of the fact that the car wash investigations have been good in many ways of having um, uh, put some corrupt politicians um, in jail. Wash, the car wash operation being the Petrobus. Yes, that's right. The fact of the matter is that, for instance, it has been very lenient on the right-wing politicians such as Eduardo Cunha that has only been taken out now after the impeachment, when this had been ongoing for more than a year and he was doing everything um, in Congress and acting, threatening people even, and he was not put aside. And so the thing with Tema now is also a question mark. Will they really force this f forward. Um, another person who has also been uh, uh, involved in allegations of corruption is Aesio Nevis from the Pestebir, the opposition party, who was defeated four times in a row 
and also was defeated with he was the presidential candidate when Lu, uh, when Dilma ran for her election in 2014 and from that day one when he lost that is when they started to create the whole climate towards the impeachment mm. and he has been um, accused eight times in the car wash investigations only in the last month did the justice um, um, court decide to investigate him and they put this forward to the Supreme Court, but in one day, they already suspended the investigation. So that means it's not going to continue. So this is another element that has emerged in this crisis, is the, the disillusionment that people have had with Brazilian institutions. When people were thinking that actually it was about cleaning the corruption process, it was actually something serious, Again, in the last months, people have started to doubt this, which is why The Guardian, for instance, in its editorial, highlighted that the whole Brazilian political system was the one that needed to be on trial, not just a blaming of one person. Of course, uh, scorpions sting because they're scorpions, and right-wing forces act in the way that they do because they are right-wing forces. I'm more concerned with looking at the Workers' Party and its mistakes and mm -hmm. shortcomings, mm -hmm. uh, because that's of Brazilian, but also wider yeah. uh, importance. Right. Now, I was struck uh, as someone who lent $200 to Lula in 1983. Now think of the interest on that. <laughs> I was struck by the fact that the Workers' Party today has only around a million members in a population of 200 million. British Labour Party has getting on for a million in a country that is uh, a third a th of the smaller, size. Yes. Why is the Workers' Party not bigger? Why has the high hopes of Lula's yes. initial political entry into power appear to have dissipated so much that not one worker in Brazil is on strike over all this. Not a shot has been fired in defense of the Workers' Party government. These are hard facts that we yes. have to confront. What's your analysis of that? Well, this, has, uh, this is very complex, but it has to do with first the disillusionment that most of the left has had with the party, which was basically um, when it entered politics, it, it said that it was going to change the whole ethical procedure. And unfortunately, it had to adapt to the whole structure in terms of um, being omissive or lenient towards corruption. Another thing has also been the fact that this um, uh, dissatisfaction coming in from the left that you say and from workers has grown particularly in the last two to three years when the economy started to go down and the recession hit and this was something that Dilma for instance did not manage to handle properly and that started to produce unemployment. So you combine that recipe of corruption allegations, a strong also campaign coming from the right, taking the advantage of that, plus a media coverage, highly uh, questionable and partisan, including uh, journalists, former journalists like myself and others who have been brought up with a professional objective mainstream journalism criticizing from inside the mainstream media um, resulted in this explosive uh, 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 sense that in order to solve the problems um, the impeachment was the best solution so it's a combination of factors right and the assessment of the good things that the workers party have done in the last uh, uh, decades also have been minimized in the mainstream media so the perception was much more the negative than the positive and this culminated in the lack of support but as of what I've said in the beginning what has happened in the last two or three months is that people are waking up to the reality of how the situation is much more complex than a black and white scenario sure. of the good guys and the bad guys. Well, on the subject of black and white, <laughs> uh, Gayatri had a, a point to make about the makeup of the new cabinet. This is obviously all white European descendant and all men. And then in, um, uh, to compensate that, Tamar, I, I, I understand, has appointed um, 
the economic of the bank with the, with the female head. But how is that being perceived in Brazil? Um, well, it's been highly criticized. And the thing is, as I mentioned before, when I talked about the campaign of the right, we need to understand the difference between what the right in Brazil is, the conservative sectors, towards what the right is in Europe and in the UK. Yeah. What you have there in Brazil is a right that is extremely traditional conservative with values that date back, some argue, to the 1960s of the dictatorship, or we can even take this as far as the 19th century. So the views of women, for instance, are traditional views of women's role in society. Mm -hmm. This came out quite clearly when Dilma was um, uh, uh, put aside with stories um, in uh, the, 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 the uh, mainstream magazines talking about the future first lady of Marcela Temba and how how beautiful and from the home she is. Right. She's, and he, she's 40 years younger than him. That's right, 42. That's right. Nice work if you can get it. <laughs> and this is something that comes in contrast to last year, which was considered the year of the female Arab Spring in Brazil, where women took the, to the streets to pressure for more rights, wanting Dilma and the current government to advance their rights and also because they feared the right-wing backlash and they feared Cunha was also pushing forward a project uh, um, which would criminalize abortion and the victims of rape, which would have to make them go to um, a, a doctor to try to prove that they were raped. So what we have is not the fact that people want a left or a right. The thing is, both the left and the right need to learn from their mistakes. The mistakes of the left I've just told you now. The the stakes of the right is that it needs to update itself and become a modern right. If it argues mm. that it looks to the future, so the project of Tema is the project called Project to the Future, mm. and people are criticizing it and saying, well, actually, that's a project to the past. The only thing in terms that they have any connection towards European politics is the neoliberal or the economic agenda. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. on the that, re that is the only on thing. On that, they're on the same page. But, uh, Dr. Carlina, we have to leave it there. It's been a fascinating tour de horizon of the Brazilian scene. I'm really grateful to you for joining us on the Sputnik. Coming up next, it's Nakba time. Again, it's a catastrophe, but nobody knows it. Don't go away. Welcome back to Sputnik. As Israel celebrates its independence, the Palestinians mourn their Nakba, or catastrophe, the day their country ceased to exist, their people banished to the four corners of the earth as refugees. Hundreds of their towns and villages were destroyed and built over. Thousands were massacred to make the others flee, and they did. 800,000 Palestinians were driven from their land and homes and were never allowed to return, though they remained the legal owners of that land and property. In the 68 years since, their numbers have become more than 13 million. Next year is the centenary of Britain's authorship of this catastrophe. Perhaps it will get some attention then. It certainly isn't now, except for here. With us to discuss it is Palestinian academic and journalist from Gaza, welcome, Yusuf al Hilu. Yusuf, first of all, for the viewers, succinctly describe what happened in the Nakba. Well, the Nakba, uh, the catastrophe that started in 1948, marks the expulsion of the indigenous population of Palestine at the time. Uh, Zionist militias, uh, the Argun, um, uh, carried out uh, massacres. Um, forced people to flee their homes and towns. At the time, about 500 towns and villages were wiped off the map. About 750,000 people were forced to flee. Um, massacres were committed. Um, so basically, um, the indigenous population were forced to flee for people from Europe to come and live in Palestine. And that Nakba sparks uh, the beginning of the ethnic cleansing project. So the Nakba is still ongoing until this moment. Uh, I'm a descendant of a refugee. I'm not allowed to go and even visit the town of my grandfather's town, which is only a few kilometers to the north of Gaza uh, Strip. Uh, like the rest of uh, refugees uh, who are still live in refugee camps in Gaza, West Bank, or elsewhere, are not allowed to visit. Um, I'm well-traveled. I've been to so many countries, and I wish 
one day that I'm able to visit the town of my uh, grandfather. Um, so each year, Palestinians uh, who live inside or who, those who are in exile, they um, stress on the right of return. Uh, it's a sacred right. Uh, people still carry and keep the keys and documents that prove their ownership, uh, ownership of their properties. Um, um, each time, uh, Palestinians also carry out um, these events. They try to um, show that they still uh, keep their identity through uh, the Palestinian um, embroidery, the, um, uh, the Palestinian uh, food, the cuisine, um, the folklore dance. Um, in Gaza alone, there are six refugee camps. Two-thirds of Gaza population are uh, descendants uh, of uh, refugee. And uh, we hear comments by Israeli officials that they will not allow, they will never allow the right of Palestinian uh, refugees uh, to return. This is the key point, uh, because the first part of what you described, the massacres, driving people away and so on, this has happened lamentably to many peoples in many parts of the world. The key difference is that nobody ever said that because you flee, you're never allowed to come back. Because you fled, someone else can live in your house and own your orchard. Uh, but that's what has happened in the case of the Palestinians, isn't it? Isn't the right of return, therefore, the absolutely key demand? And why do Palestinian leaders uh, pay so little attention to that in their discourse? Well, the Palestinians have been living in a set of limbo. Obviously, we have a weak leadership. Uh, the Palestinian Authority, led by President Abbas, he's, you know, made some concessions. And he himself, he announced that he's willing to give up his right of return to his original village. Um, and Palestinians were provoked, were outraged from that st statement. Um, obviously, the right of return is a sacred right. It's the only, um, I mean, for any lasting peace solution to take place in the occupied territories, refugees have um, to return. Um, also, Palestinians came up with the idea of uh, one state solution because the Israelis keep refusing this option, saying that the demographic um, level uh, will be in favor of Palestinians. But it's not our um, problem in the first place. Uh, Golda Meir, um, one of the Israeli uh, officials at the time, uh, said that uh, the old will die and the young will forget. But we say no. We will never forget. We will teach the love of our homeland to our children. If it's not in our lifetime, the next generation will keep the flag. Just to add to that, as uh, Arafat as well at the time said, uh, very politically incorrectly worded, we will not become like the Red Indians. We will not yes. end up in a museum. We will keep on fighting. Yeah, at the time, um, they claimed, the Zionist um, officials claimed that Palestine was, the, was a land without a people for a people without a land. But why should we pay the price of what happened to our cousins, to the Jewish people in, in Germany at the time. I mean, um, why do I have to suffer that so for that other people come and live in my country? So those examples that you described, George, um, there are so many examples, people who have never been in Palestine, they um, wish one day to return. And um, at schools, at events, uh, people are eager to, to return, um, you know, it's, it's a human basic right mm. to be able to travel freely from place to another place. Well, look, we, we've just made a, a film about, uh, about Tony Blair. And in the film, there's a piece of actuality of Mr. Blair saying quite properly in the Kosovan refugee camps uh, during the Yugoslav war that, uh, that these refugees have a legal and moral right to return to their homes and we will never rest until they do. That's true. Uh, but why is it only true for Kosovans and not for Palestinians? Why is the world so deaf to the cries of the Palestinians who have the keys and the title to land that somebody from Brooklyn or London is living in? Well, many UN resolutions uh, were never implemented. 191 that um, uh, states Palestinian refugees have to return. Um, unfortunately, um, you know, when it comes to Palestine-Israel conflict, we know that um, a green light is given to the Israelis by the American administration. When it comes to criticize Israel straight away, those comments are classified as anti-Semite. Um, unfortunately, you know, this is, it's, it's not fair. It's, it's the, the, the law of jungle. 
Um, Palestinians have lost faith in the so-called international community, the United Nations, the UN Security Council, and the only hope they now, they pin their hopes on civil society organizations, freedom living people, those who come up with idea to show solidarity, whether it's BDS or something else, peaceful demonstrations, and Palestinians are peaceful. You know, it struck me, some um, people ask me, oh, you come from Palestine, Gaza. Oh, I see that you are smiling. You are a normal person. People have this idea about us that we are violent. We are not. You know, we are the most loving, peaceful people in the world because we have been living under oppression for the past 68 years. Um, imagine Gaza has got a, a coastline 40 kilometers on the Mediterranean, and we are forced to import frozen fish from the Israelis. Our fishermen come under fire. Gaza seaport is the only, the only uh, port is it closed, has been closed on the Mediterranean since 1967. So we feel that you know, the world has let us down, and uh, people have lost faith. Maybe one day um, justice will be done, hopefully. When I started working on the Palestine question in 1973, mm -hmm. I promise you, you could have fitted all the supporters of the PLO into this room mm -hmm. in the whole of Britain. But now, millions of people support the Palestinians, and millions are ready to march and and boycott and uh, divest and take sanctions and so mm. on. At the same time, in the <clears throat> Arab world, the support for the Palestinians, which was once universal, has slumped almost to zero. How do you explain that paradox? Well, I think uh, the Palestinian cause um, has caused some headache for the Arabs who let us down in the first place. And to be honest, Palestinians, they value the support of people international people, pro-Palestinians, such as yourself and other people, because we feel there is real uh, spirit that people show solidarity with the, with the oppressed people. Um, you have people worldwide who would love to go and break the siege to show solidarity, and they have to hide their identity uh, to say that they are going uh, for tourism, whereas they go to show solidarity. The facts are crystal clear, George. You know, you have people on the ground who use the social media nowadays. Uh, everybody, the young people, um, they are eager to become journalists, they, to, to show the truth, to uh, reveal the, what's going on, because they are fed up from the biased coverage of some of the Western media, um, media outlets. Most of them. So um, people know more now. Mm -hmm. There's awareness. Uh, they go by themselves. And Palestine, maybe it's the only country across the world still occupied. Um, and it's people show well, the, the extremism. It's the, the only country I'm unable to get to. Uh, Lastly, next year, 2017, is the centenary of the Balfour Declaration, Britain's authorship of the Nakba, many would say. Uh, what do you think will happen? What would you like to see happen next year in the centenary of the Balfour Declaration? Well, if you ask any Palestinian, uh, who do you blame in the first place? They will tell you Britain. Yeah. That gave the right for these people to come and live in Palestine. Obviously, during Nakba events, Palestinians I interviewed people, they, they hold Britain responsible, saying that Britain has to do something. Bill for Declaration uh, was the most unjust decision that was made uh, in, in recent history. So this is what people want, like myself. You know, everybody has to, pray, to play a major role to um, implement uh, justice. Um, Obviously, uh, people show solidarity. The officials have to, to find a solution to pressure the Israelis to implement UN resolutions to abide by international law. You know, it's enough for 68 years. And each year we commemorate the Nakba, and who knows how long it will take. But Palestinians have hope at the end of this dark tunnel, something positive will happen. God willing. Yusuf, thanks for joining us okay. on the Sputnik. <laughs> and now it's your turn to tell us what you think through the portals of social media. What's rattling, Gayatri? Well, we asked what on earth is happening in Brazil. And Wilson Mello says it's a rightist coup d'etat. They ousted a clear woman that was preventing them from stealing. She was therefore not good for their business. And Leo says, accompanied with a picture of Dilma back at the time during the dictatorship on trial, says the Brazilian government has been after her for a while and backed by the USA. 
It's interesting that neither Russia nor China nor many Latin American countries have yet recognized this coup d'etat government. Yeah. And uh, who knows, uh, it might not yet be the final story. Well, we didn't discuss this with, uh, with our guests, but a lot of people on social media absolutely believe the USA is behind it. About Britain's role uh, in the Nakba, Jabber says bringing back the rights to its people is the important part of story, else it is useless. And Sri Hamartulus says talk is cheap, but in Palestine, Arab blood is even cheaper. Sorry to say, but that's true. And those are all the tweets for today. Which, alas, means that's the end of the show. But you can stay in touch with us through the social media on Twitter, RT underscore Sputnik, or on Facebook, Sputnik on Russia Today. It's goodbye from me, Gayatri. And from me, George Galloway. It's been marvellous.